So Michelle Anderson has graciously accepted this opportunity to join us during this Open Education Week and share her experiences with finding and putting OER materials into her courses. And so we're gonna hear from her today. She is a clinical assistant professor here at Idaho State University in the School of Nursing graduate program. And she's been a family nurse practitioner for the past 22 years, having practice in rural and urban settings and has owned and operated her own NP clinic in rural Idaho for 12 years prior to transitioning to education. She teaches one of the fundamental core courses for DNP students, Advanced Health Assessment, along with other didactic courses. Dr. Anderson has received professional awards for her service through recognition in her community as a top healthcare provider, state recognition with a Preceptor of the Year Award, and national recognition through NP for clinical excellence in 2013 and advocacy in 2018. She was awarded fellowship through NP in 2019, and Dr. Anderson resides in Meridian and enjoys spending time with her family and staying active in the community. She also sits on the faculty senate here at ISU, and she represents Idaho's NPs as the state liaison for NP. So welcome, Michelle, and we are excited to hear about your experience. So I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and happy to share my experience with OER. It was new to me when I heard about it, so I did a lot of learning. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Are you able to see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So I was hoping to introduce open end resources in advanced health assessment. And that is one of the core courses, one of the three P's for the DNP. And this was the physical exam P. The other two are pathophysiology and pharmacology. So it is definitely one of the core stabilizing courses. It's presented during the first year of the DNP program. And it is presented to both our FNP students, which is family nurse practitioner, and our PMHMP students, which are our psych mental health nurse practitioners. So it hits probably the most amount of students because it's a criteria to move forward in the program no matter which track you're going on. So why did I want to do this? First, a learning experience for myself, but separate from that, no surprise to anybody who probably looks at open-end resources is the fact that there's a lot of cost in graduate tuition accompanied by a super high cost in health textbooks. Anytime you're in a health science program, the textbooks are crazy expensive. So I thought it would be a great benefit for the students if I could find something that would alleviate some of that financial pressure, especially in a post-COVID era where resources are more expensive in general and sometimes they're not able to work when they're in the program. So finding any way to alleviate some financial stress would be great. So I applied for the program. And then I received confirmation that I had been accepted for the stipend and the application in April of 2022. My whole plan was always to use it in a health science course as opposed to some of the other didactic courses that are part of the curriculum, such as health leadership, health policy. Thinking back, those might have been better and easier choices, but I tried to go for this route here because these are some of the more costly courses in general. And then I just implemented it in this past spring, starting in January. We only have this course available always set in the spring semester. So I just had to wait a period of time before implementing it. Something that's unique to the Graduate School of Nursing program is the fact that we do an online platform. So I think we are heavily into utilizing the Moodle platform and the learning platform that is available to us. So almost everything we present that way is asynchronous. It is asynchronous, so it's not done as a live lecture. Almost everything's pre-recorded, so it allows students to access materials at their own will and leisure. So it's incredibly important to have a full dynamic platform that's very easy for a student to use and move through. I thought this would be a really good opportunity to do this. The challenge it was actually coming down to finding the required material. Now there is a search that is put forward that you do and the ITRC staff are incredibly helpful in showing you how to do that search. And I did, I went through myself, I followed. It was a process, a learning process for myself to look for these OER sources, but I was happy to do it. There's tons of options and different platforms you can look through looking for the books that would best suit your objectives in your course. And they're there to help you in the design of your course if you need and to make sure that it matches your objectives if possible. I did that and I couldn't find anything that would fit 
the advanced level of the course. I think what's important to recognize is that there are plenty of undergraduate assessment textbooks. So I think in an undergraduate health science course, there are a lot of opportunities with open end resources that are already present. But at the advanced graduate level, the advanced nursing level, there was just nothing there at that time. So I looked and I looked with the search instructions, but I had some, I had difficulty finding what was appropriate. So I did the call the friend. The OER team is amazing. They give you a lot of opportunities to implement and who to reach out to for assistance. So all that is present and amazing. So my call a friend was Kim Miller. She is an amazing librarian on our campus here. And I was actually being on radio and I was able to walk down the hallway and talk with her in person as well as work with her online. And she was invaluable to me in helping me determine that number one, I was searching correctly, which was important. I needed to make sure I was looking at all the right avenues. But unfortunately, that nothing was available at the no or low cost end on open end resources. So we definitely identified an important gap. Um, and I think that's really important to know that because it's great to have the opportunity to fill that gap if you can. Why not build up an open resource that can be used? Unfortunately, when it's looking at health assessment and it's just me trying to do it, I don't have enough time in the day to put together a health assessment textbook that would meet the needs for the students. So if anybody's out there who's interested in working together on something like that, I'm your caller friend. I'm happy to work with you. But what she found, and these are quotes from her messages to me, was that the majority of what is available are lower level resources and likely not appropriate for the level of study for my course. And then another thing we do for health assessment are videos. We do a lot of learning videos. And she found that the majority she saw were from nurses were on YouTube creating content. And those were things we were already fortunately using in the course, but I was able to reach out and find a few more that fit the course better. So I was able to do that. Something she did show me was doing one of the searches online, she put in the musculoskeletal system and she came up with 89 different choices for musculoskeletal assessment that are available for open end resources. So maybe for PT or for people in the physical therapy or PA program or other nursing programs in the undergraduate level, there might be some fabulous resources out there for you to use and pull forward and give to your students and provide them that access that um, would be no cost to them because there are a lot out there. There was nothing that specifically what I was looking for. So implementation. So when I went to put this into our course, I posted an announcement in the actual announcement section in the Moodle course. And what I found were eBooks. A colleague of mine had talked about the eBooks and then Kim Miller was able to provide me information on eBooks and how to do it. And eBooks are interesting. I didn't even know they existed until I looked for them, until I was trying to do some OER. And what they are is they're utilized through the library and they're utilized through clinical key. And you search under clinical key in the library link, and then you can pick a system or a subject or a textbook or whatever you want. When you look on the left side, you use the source type to narrow it down to eBooks. And then you remove the expander that says to also search with full text of the articles and you'll see what's left. Fortunately for me, what I found were the two textbooks that I actually use in my course. There's Seidel's Physical Exam 10th Edition and Habib's Clinical Dermatology. I also use another Fitzpatrick Dermatology and that was not available, but one of the two that I recommend in the course were available. And the best thing about them is they were the most recent editions. So they weren't old editions, they were brand new editions. So it was brand new information that was relevant to what I was teaching directly out of. And the unique thing about eBooks is that when you utilize them, they're only available to three students at a time. So three students can be open, have it open at the same time. And depending upon how they check them out, it will close as soon as they close out of that system or they can check them out for about up to a week. Now, if a fourth student comes in and wants to utilize that same text, they will be given a notification that says that they just can't, that it's currently being used. And they can check back to see when it might be available again. So in an asynchronous learning environment, that's sometimes helpful because although it may not be available right then, you can check back in. If it's a morning you're checking, you can check back in and afternoon and see what it's showing and then you can maybe have access to it. It's not the full resource available all the time but it is a resource that has no cost associated with it for the student that they can access and they were the most recent editions of things I was actually utilizing in my course. The other thing I implemented as I mentioned earlier were the YouTube created content that's specific for health assessment at an advanced practice level. I would post videos like just this week we're doing pediatrics so I have videos posted for 
the neonate and for the two month visit and the six month visit and the nine month and the 12 month. So they can watch other healthcare providers providing that full assessment and they can hone their skills by looking at it that way before they themselves have to do a pass off exam of a similar level so that they can move forward in that kind of checkbox part of the pediatric health assessment course. So that is how I implemented what I could find. Talking about impact, I'm still unsure and it's pending because my course is only halfway through. I did post another announcement asking for feedback on if anybody had accessed the eBooks and if so, how that worked out for them. I had not had any replies, but they're all just starting their clinicals right now. So they're probably busy focusing on a few other things and looking in the announcement section. I don't know what that impact will be. That is to be determined. And then takeaways. I think the biggest thing from having done this experience is what I took away from it. And the first thing is we definitely need to find or create more OER for graduate level health assessment. Kim Miller definitely recommended that if you develop any supplementary materials, it might be worth contacting the ITRC to see what kind of support they might be able to offer. And all my experience has been that ITRC is super supportive and helpful. So like I said, again, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to see if there's something we can develop together. I just probably don't have the bandwidth myself to do it all independently, but there is that gap. And I think it is important to fill that gap. I think there's great material available for undergraduate nursing and other health assessment courses, I wouldn't walk away from that opportunity because like I said, all the additions, everything that was out there was phenomenal. It just wasn't available at the level I needed it at. And then my last takeaway is definitely that I would love to do this again, but perhaps I would choose a different course because there were so many books out there. I saw I could, oh, if I chose a health policy, oh my gosh, look at all these books I could have used for health policy. And that would have been amazing. So if I was to do it again and use OER and implement OER again, and I definitely probably can, hence the purpose of all this, is I would probably do it for more of a didactic course than a clinical course at the graduate level until some of those other materials can be created to, to support it. And that is my presentation. So if anybody has any questions, I will stand for those. Thank you, Michelle. That was great information. And I think just knowing some of that variety that can be implemented with OER is good for everybody to know. So if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or to unmute yourself, and we would love to hear what those are. And while everyone's thinking, maybe I'll ask you a question, Michelle. Sure. I know briefly before the meeting, we talked a little bit about maybe starting a press book for your course or for a different course, possibly. What kind of ideas have you gathered or what, how would you like to begin that process if you were to put things into press books? I don't actually know an answer to that question, Kimberly. I'm not as familiar with a press book, so you'd have to explain its purpose and such. But if it's just about gathering information to create your own OER, if that's what a press book is, I would start with what's most common, what we teach. I would start with lecture material that I already use. Yeah, and the idea behind press books is exactly what you think it is. It's a repository place to gather material and to even write your own. So if there are things that you write as if you were going to write your own textbook and publish it, then that's certainly something that you can do with Pressbooks. And we have a Pressbooks instance here at Idaho State. So anyone with an ISU email address is welcome to create an account and to use Pressbooks and just to see what, what its capabilities are. And it is very robust. So if anybody's interested, then we would love to hear from you. Does that's anyone great. have any questions for Michelle? From the start? From the time that you were awarded the stipend to the time that you implemented for spring semester, how much time do you think you invested in doing all of this and getting this created? It wasn't a huge task in all fairness because it took probably the search for the right material or looking to see if I could find the right material was the biggest front end workload part. And it didn't, and then when I couldn't find it, and that probably, I probably spent a week to two weeks off and on going into that search thing to see if I was looking at it the right way, to find a different way to look, to check all the different links that are present there, because there's a bunch of links you can look through. I would say I probably put between 12 to 15 hours into surfing. Sometimes a lot and sometimes not, but it was very easy 
searches were quick for me because I could very easily determine what level the textbook was at and if it was going to be helpful and then I could move on. So just looking through all the links and making sure I'd hit them all appropriately and then reaching out to Kim Miller with the library system and then she put in her own work behind it and then reaching out to me and I sat down and talked with her for a period of time. It wasn't a huge amount of work and I think more so because I wasn't able to find what I was looking for. I think if I'd been able to find what I needed, there would have been more legwork involved in reaching out to ITRC to implement it into the course and what that would look like. But because I didn't have it, it was, I would say it wasn't a huge load for me. Thank you. There is a question in the chat and Kim has also put in the link to the resources that the ISU library has for the OER guide. Spencer asks, are you using them as supplemental or required reading? The two textbooks that I have, the Seidel and the Habib are required. And I do have a follow-up question. You mentioned that three users can access the resource at one, at one time. Have you had any students like reach out and say, I can't get this, or has it been pretty even that when a student wants it, there's at least one slot available that they can access it? I was talking with Kim about this just before the presentation. I haven't heard anything from the students about it. So that's good and bad news because typically graduate students, if something's not working, you hear instantaneously that, hey, you said this was available, it's not working, or I can never get in. So I'd like to think that because no news is good news in this scenario. The other is I had asked Kim if she had ability to see if any of the students had been accessing the textbooks. And there is a search she can do. The information isn't instantaneous, and I don't have that, but that would be one I would look at is pending impact. And maybe this is a question for Kim Miller. Is there a way to sign up on a waiting list, like so that you could be next in line for that reserved material? Or is it you just have to get on there when there's a space available? Yeah, so it depends. We have lots of different types of ebook packages. So that's why when you talk to us and we're like, what well, depends, we buy. In most cases, it will be where you need to, if a student just like say opens an ebook on their computer and doesn't download it or check it out, as soon as they close their session, then the next person can jump on. And in that case, it really is the luck of the draw. If a student chooses to download the book, and actually check it out. I am not sure if there is a way to then have used the same process to put yourself on a wait list. It probably depends on the package itself. So we would have to take a look at that. One of the challenges of eBooks in academic libraries is they really don't necessarily follow the same model as, that we're familiar with for public libraries or through a Kindle or something like that, where we do know I'm fourth in line for the latest bestseller at library district. And so that is one of the challenging things about academic library eBooks is they aren't quite as robust in the same way that we're familiar with, with other types of more popular works. That's good information for the rest of us to be aware of. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask Michelle today? I think I might have one or two more questions. I was wondering if uh, adopting or adapting this new material had changed the way you taught the class. Did it influence your pedagogy at all or? It didn't because it was not new to me per se in regards to the textbooks. They're the ones I used already. So there wasn't anything different that way. It was just fortuitous that they were available via eBooks for the students. I think if there had been something available um, on OER that I could have implemented that was different from what I was familiar with already, then yes, it would have. I don't think it would have and changed the objectives of the course or anything that way, but it may have altered how I presented the data depending upon what that information looked like. Yeah, maybe that could have influenced when you taught certain things differently. Maybe just the way that it was organized, if it was different. That's really interesting. It sounds to me like using the library resources, actually, it, it didn't increase the amount of time you had to spend on changing things. Is that what you're saying? That's correct, 100%. Yeah. Oh, well, my time was spent, the time I used towards this was all spent in the initial search, looking for other resources that might have been open and available. Maybe one other question. I don't know if this has been already addressed, but if you were to give advice to someone who are, who was doing this for the first time, what advice would you give them? I would tell them to set aside some time to look through all the links that are available and provided to see if they can find what they want, but not to hesitate to reach out to the resources that are available because they can guide you even better. And they, it's a huge time save because if you're not familiar with where you're looking or how to look, finding someone who is super beneficial and time is important to all of us. Thank you. Does 
<clears throat> Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask before we finish today? So Michelle, I don't know if you talked a little bit about the design of your course or if you had to alter that design to implement these new resources, but how extensive was that in order to prepare your class to teach it this spring? I didn't have to do anything because I couldn't find the actual, I couldn't, I didn't have an OER to pull in. The only thing I had was implementing the links to the eBooks. And I just documented that all in the announcement section under the Moodle page so that all students would be emailed that information so they could have it. And what I did because I knew it was coming up and I had already searched that by the end of fall, I had already put it into one of their classes there. So they knew coming into spring that would be available to them. So it wasn't going to be, oh my gosh, I spent all this money, but I could have had this book at this time frame with these stipulations in place at no cost. I made sure I presented that information to them and that I would be implementing or having that access available in that course. So I put that in my fall at the end of my fall semester in one of the classes I knew most of them were in. And then I put it right away in the announcement section of the new. But aside from those adjustments, I didn't have to do anything different but my understanding was that if I had to implement more and spend more time on my course that ITRC would have been able to help me with the instructional design of what that looked like so that it would continue to flow well so I was not worried that if I found it I wouldn't have enough time to put it together because I knew I would have help yes I appreciate that answer and yes as Michelle mentioned the ITRC has staff that can help put things in place and design it in the way that you intend so that your students aren't confused and so that they know what to expect and have those resources available then, to them. So thank you for that. Any other questions for Michelle? Okay, then thank you so much, Michelle, for being here today and for sharing your experience. We sure appreciate it. And we hope that you, the rest of you will join us for the upcoming open ed week events that we have and you can find those on the library blog and Spencer if you wouldn't mind putting that link in the chat for us so that people can access it if you haven't signed up for the other sessions please take a look at when those are and if you have an open slot in your schedule and it coincides then please join us for those and thank you for taking the time today everybody and especially Michelle thank you and that link is in the chat if anybody wants to access it there Thank you.